Hello there. So, uh, I'm reading the Book of Esther, and I'm on the section, which is, it's thir uh, 11, 2 through 12, 6, which if you don't have the full Bible, that is to say you have, don't have the Alexandrian canon, I'll get into canons later, and maybe a little bit of canons now. The, a canon is the rule by which you pick what books are actually the inspired books of the Bible or not. It, that's according to a church tradition. So the Bible doesn't contain an inspired index that tells you what's in it. It's the church that decides it's or a church or a religious group that decides that. And that's by an oral tradition, a, a, a religious tradition by which that's done. So the F Sadducees only had the first five books, the Torah. The S Pharisees had a larger canon, the prophets, or at least most of the prophets, as well as the Torah, the first five books, the Pentateuch, and then also they had some of the writings that were with them. But they didn't have all of the ones that other groups had, such as the Alexandrian canon. So, uh, and because of the this Alexandrian canon, we have more chapters in the book of Esther than you would find in the rabbinic canon that is followed by, by many people. The Catholic Church has the Alexandrian canon, the, the Vulgate version of the Alexandrian canon. And so I'm reading chapter for March 20th here, the additions to Esther. Now, these additions are interesting because they have a really mention of God. It has a, a real religious dimension rather than acting as it's all depending on Esther and Mordecai to deliver the people. The God is really acting in this. And this prologue, it's, it's Mordecai's dream. Mordecai is the male hero of it, the kinsman of Esther. As the, to sum up the story of the book of Esther, it's basically that uh, Esther uh, it ends up being caught up in a sort of uh, Miss Persia dragnet because the king is looking for a replacement for his wife Vashti who had he thought insulted him by not coming when she was summoned. And so they don't know that Esther Hadassah is Jewish. So they take, she's taken and she's brought into the harem. She becomes a favorite wife. And, but there is a plot to destroy the Jewish people under the uh, direction of Haman the Agagite. And so he is arranging all this. He convinces the king that the, they're out to destroy the kingdom. So there's going to be this genocide. So Mordecai goes to Esther and says, this is why God, this is why you were brought into this situation. So she does, she saves the people. She has this, says she's going to have a dinner and the king is invited and Haman is invited. And then she exposes Haman and then Haman and his followers are hanged, and the festival of Purim comes from this. They're uh, celebrating this deliverance. But these uh, Greek editions have a God really as the center of this. So the, the so the these editions emphasize the helplessness of the human being without God and that God is there for us. And so in this here on the, this addition to, 
to Esther. It's, called, it's often called addition A. In the second year of the reign of Aha, Ahataxa Eris, the great, on the first day of Nisan, Mordecai, son of Jair, son of Shimei, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, had a dream. He was a Jew living in the city of Susa, a great man serving in the court of the king. He was one of the captives whom King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had brought from Jerusalem with King Jeconiah of Judea. And this was his dream. Noises and confusion, thunders and earthquake, tumult on the earth. Then two great dragons came forward, both ready to fight, and they roared terribly. At their roaring, every nation prepared for war to fight against the righteous nation. It was a day of darkness and gloom, of tribulation and distress, affliction and great tumult on the earth. And the whole righteous nation was troubled. They feared the evils that threatened them, and they were ready to perish. Then they cried out to God, and at their outcry, as though from a tiny spring, there came a great river, and an abundant with abundant water. Light came, and the sun rose, and the lowly were exalted, and devoured those held in honor. Mordecai saw in this dream what God had determined to do, and after he awoke, he had it on his mind, seeking all day to understand it in every detail. So this is, it's like the dream of, you know, uh, these sort of prophetic dreams that you find in Daniel and other places. And here there's this apocalyptic confrontation of these forces of evil, the two dragons, against the righteous nation, which would have been the persecuted, the Anawim, the poor ones of, of, of Israel, at this of the uh, Israelite people. And this is probably more directed to people going through the persecution at the time of the Maccabees, in which the the Seleucid kingdom of Syria, they wanted to exterminate uh, the Jewish religion and, and any practitioner of the Jewish religion. And so there was the revolt, and then we get the festival of Hanukkah from that, when the, the miracle of the, the lights in the temple. And the, here uh, in Chinese culture, for example, dragons are often considered a, a, a sign of of something good, of, of good luck, of protection. But in the, the Semitic culture, in, in the Bible in particular, it's, uh, they're usually not represented as something good, but as a, a force of evil, a symbol of force of evil. It's the forces of evil here, these conflicting things, whether the Ptolemies and the Seleucids fighting together or whatever. And, uh, but more poignantly, in a personal meaning, it's the uh, the forces of evil, the two forces of evil, such like the world and the flesh, for example, uh, battling even within ourselves. Of this, that this is that we have to take action in this. We have to be on the right side. We have to be of the righteous nation. And so, there's this imagery that's very. Uh, profound with all of the the tumults, all of the noises and confusion, thunders and earthquakes, tumult on the earth. So the, the two great dragons get ready to fight and they roar terribly. I don't know. They all, it's, so in the book of Revelation, you have the dragon too, which is the, the symbol of, of, of the most profound evil, and which is warring against they're the woman who's bringing forth the child would be Mary bringing forth the one who would rule with the rod of iron, which would be the Christ, Hamashiach, the, the anointed one. Then so, uh, but here it said, with a day of darkness and gloom of tribulation and distress, very apocalyptic description there, affliction and great tumult on the earth, 
and the whole righteous nation was troubled, and they feared the evils that threatened them, and they were ready to perish. Then they cried out to God, and he... Excuse me, there was a little interruption there. I pushed some button, I guess. And then they cried out to God, and at their outcry, as though from a tiny spring there came a great river with abundant water, light came, the sun rose, and the lowly were exalted and devoured those held in honor. So we should never give up, never think that God has cast us away. No, God is there with us. He's right here with you now. Whatever you're going through, he is there with you. And he is this water of life to refresh you in the midst of this. He is the great river to carry you forth. He is there for you. Well, thank you very much. And bye now. <laughs>